Hey, it's Rabanzo here. As a gigging musician and fan of live music, I love sharing my personal experience and the things I'm learning from other music artists and professionals. You can be privy to those learnings by joining the Unstarving Musician community. In the process, you will be supporting me and this podcast. Just go to unstarvingmusician.com to join. You'll get an email from me, usually every 7 to 10 days, with tips, insights, secrets, all intended to help make your music journey a little better and brighter. All right, let's do this. This is the Unstarving Musicians Podcast. The podcast features conversations with musicians and music industry professionals, all intended to help musicians be better at marketing, business, the creative process, and all the other things that empower us to do more of what we love. Make music. My guest in this episode is Australian gone Californian, so Californian. Lee Coulter. Lee was brought to my attention by Lisa Sanders, who was in a recent episode. Lee and Lisa frequent the infamous or famous, (laughs) the very hip Java Joes of San Diego, which is apparently quite the um, center of music in that area. He recently had a number one on iTunes, a number one song on iTunes in Australia and New Zealand, which we talk about, the circumstances of which we talk about. What a great guy. Uh, Perhaps not super young. He is young, though. But he comes across artistically and just as a man grounded and wise. Maybe he's an old soul. I don't know. He's had a whirlwind ride at times, yet he shares what life was really like when those whirlwind moments were happening. Super honest moments here. He's he's modest about pretty much everything he's done, in my my opinion, here after speaking with him. He tells me a little bit about the San Diego music scene, including a little background on the aforementioned Java Joes, and man, timing is everything. I happened to catch Lee at a moment when he was up for air and was able to to book this chat, so I feel lucky. We didn't, I didn't have to chase, we didn't have to chase each other around for weeks uh, amidst a tour schedule or something else. I just was super lucky. He's doing all he's ever wanted to do, which is make music. You're going to really enjoy this conversation. Oh, and at the end, you get to hear that number one single called We, You, Me. Yeah, it'll be at the end of this episode. Here's me and Lee Coulter. Lee, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I feel lucky that we connected so quickly. You, um, I, I'm sure you can imagine that sometimes it can take weeks <laughs> for me to actually get um, someone lined up for something like this after we make our initial communication. But uh, yeah, I feel very fortunate. So thanks again for the time. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I just, I like to, if something's on the cards and I got an opening, I'm just like, let's get it, let's get it done. The more, more happening, the sooner, like just better for everything. Yeah. Lucky me. You know, I was, um, doing a little, my day was a little wheels off here about midday when I'm normally doing most of my research. Um, but I was kind of doing some last minute stuff and I was watching an interview that, um, was done, by a young woman on face and that's uh, videoed on Facebook uh, with you. Um, and I, I forget the name of the show, but I was listening as soon as I heard you speak, I'm like, well, of course he has an accent that, you know, is different than mine. And, and, um, I was kind of laughing tickled that, um, Oh yeah, I'm going to be talking to this dude with a strong new, you're from New Zealand or Australia. 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 Brisbane, Australia. Yeah, I sh- that's right. Yep. <laughs> I actually have that written right here in front of me. Um, but anyway, so I hope that your lovely accent comes out today. I can tell um, uh, it probably comes and goes because you've been in California for a while, right? Yeah, yeah. I've been in California uh, 12 years, and before that was two years in Nevada. So, yeah, 14 years American. How are you liking uh, California? Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, as far as... The climate in San Diego is just perfect pretty much year-round. And then uh, also the the opportunity with music, the, the ability to play music uh, for a living. I, I mean, I'm not sure if that would have been my, my path if I stayed in Australia, but uh, it's working out in California, so you know, I appreciate it every day. That's very cool. Well, what is the music scene like in Brisbane or the other parts of Australia where you were spending time as, as an up? coming musician or a guy that from what I understand has been um, wanting to play music since you're about 10? You know what? So when I was in Australia, so I left Australia when I was 22 years old. And, and so, you know, I knew I, I knew I wanted to be a musician in, in, in you know, 
probably high school, but maybe even you know elementary school age, I was already starting to um, to, to show signs that I wanted to do that. Um, but I always used to want to be a writer. I didn't think my voice was strong enough. So I, back then, I, I didn't go out and I didn't do what I did here and do the clubs and the open mics. I didn't do anything like that. I just kind of sat in a room with my computer and recorded some stuff, wrote, wrote some stuff, recorded, but didn't really play out. So I can't really compare the experiences. Um, and and being, being quite young when I was there, um, once I got here and realized, oh, I can do open mics, and then someone said, here's 100 bucks to play a cafe, and I... So what? Someone's going to pay me to do this? Uh, that's when I started really, really getting out there and, and playing more and hanging what I did on, as a, as a live performer. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't really get to know the Australian music scene, but I know I know there's definitely parts of Australia and, and the major cities where there's, there's great music and great musicians, and they're really quite a high standard. But never was really a part of it um, because I was, just didn't get into it until I got over here. You know, I I don't. Uh, obviously don't know you terribly well. We're just kind of meeting today. And, and other than what I've read about you and heard you speak a little bit on the um, uh, video interview that I mentioned, I want to ask if, well, I was going to say that you, you strike me as um, modest about your beginnings, perhaps modest about where you are now. But do you think the, uh, was there, um, it sounds like there was a confidence issue for you, at least some of the time when you got to California and you're, you said you're um, working on doing some recordings at home, not getting out and playing until somewhat more recently. Do you think that the yeah um, that was warranted? Yeah, or? I think I think yeah. You know, I think all artists go through that, and um, it's a healthy. I think I've I've actually got that uh, confidence issues less than most artists, um, and, and I've spoken before about how I had this delusional confidence where I was just like, you know, I listen to the stuff I was making now, and I. I and back then, the stuff I was making back when I was a teenager, I used to think it was great, and I was so confident about it. I listen to it now, it's awful, but I was so <laughs> glad that I was, I, it, I, so, I was so glad, I'm so glad that I was, I felt confident about it, because if I didn't, uh, I wouldn't, have, I might, might, have, might have given up. Um, but yeah, and then I go through points where I, you know, think about what I'm doing now even, and go like, is it any good? You know, if, if I thought I was good back then, um, and I think I'm decent now, what's the difference? You know, maybe I'll look back at this stuff in 20 years and go, this is awful. So but it's, it's, as an artist, it's just hard to get a grasp on something that's subjective and, that, and that's your own. It's just hard to really view it from a, a point, a viewpoint of, of anything else. And, you know, you, you just get inside your own head. So yeah, I definitely, I def, I feel good about what I do, but I, at the same time, I can't listen to my own music. Like, so, you know, I've, I've shown up to, if someone's picked me up from the airport and they put on my music because they're excited, then I'm like, oh, can we please not listen to this? Um, because I'm just thinking, oh, I could do this better. I could do this a million different ways. So I just can't listen to it. Um, so, yeah, I guess I guess there is a bit of a confidence issue there. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but, uh, you know, I'm proud of what I do. So it, there's a balance there for sure. Yeah, good. You should be. Um, yeah, and I'm reminded that uh, as someone who's um, these days more than, than trying to do a lot musically hands-on um, just kind of creating content and, and communicating with people constantly on online on in blogs and emails and yada 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 trying to um, uh, be creative so to speak but it reminds me um, of quotes from writers that that are kind of along the lines of you, you, you know you're going to write 10 to 100 bad pages before one good page comes out so that you're kind of remind me of that and I would imagine that's all that all that you go through so um, yeah how long has it been since you have known Lisa Sanders? Um, you know, I first, when I first got to San Diego 12 years ago, I think uh, the first time I saw her was at an open mic at Twigs. The old Twigs used to be open um, down there in like the University Heights area. Um, and uh, we, did, we shared this open mic and, she, you know, she was great and, um, you know, had that powerful voice and she kind of blew me away and I was still kind of learning how to perform live at that point. Um, 12 years ago and then uh, and so I met her there and gave her some compliments and we just kind of like met each other throughout the scene um, you know we'd see I'd see her at different events just like we the whole San Diego music community is just so amazing like that it's like this built in family that you don't know who's going to show up where or when and but then you, you kind of run into each other and, and Lisa's always been there as part of that community and the most recent time I saw her she um, we shared a show at Java Joe's and she, she was hosting and did an opening set and it was lovely that's cool. When so her uh, interview is actually going to air tomorrow as we're you and I are recording this, 
and uh, you, okay. you, may, you may get a chance to, to hear this, but she she mentions you and and kind of lights her her the sound of her voice kind of lights up when she talks about you, but she didn't say your name, and so we, we, the thread of conversation was going for a couple of minutes, maybe a few minutes, and I. I backed her up to ask um, who this kid's name was because she was really excited about you. But um, she also said that you would be uh, great on the the podcast, and and uh, I know she was open to putting me in touch with you. But um, thanks to the wonders of <laughs> social media, I was able to find you. And she also yeah, super sweet. Yeah, she she really is. Um, she shared the story with me now, which I've, I've of course read a lot about since I um, started looking at your work. That you had this. Uh, very recent thing with uh, being having your, I believe your latest song, the one we talked about before recording, um, hit number one on iTunes Australia and New Zealand and happened to yeah. mention your sister's podcast in conjunction. Can you talk about that? Are they related? Yeah, yeah. It's pretty it's pretty crazy and it's been an awesome few weeks in these last few weeks, probably the most significant of my career as far as, you know, industry people reaching out and um so yeah, basically I released my new single, We You Me, and it's got another San Diego singer songwriter featured on there for a vocal and I co wrote it. Um and, and the singer is Dixie Maxwell and so it's kind of a duet and we sing the whole thing together and um and her voice just makes it kind of magical because she's got this really sweet uh, kind of really soft but husky voice, um, kind of cross between Nashville and folk music. It's just really pretty. And so I love her voice on it. And I also co-wrote it with a friend of mine, Dawn Mitchell, another San Diego, San Diego singer-songwriter. Um, and so just this collaboration and the uh, the feel of the song, just you know, something about it that was you know, really moving me and I was really excited to release it. We released it about you know just over a month ago. And then a few weeks later, it was my sister who has a massive Instagram following for her fitness and lifestyle, um, you know, Instagram. And she's, you know, she got two cute little babies that she you know, posts photos of. So I get, she always gets these, you know, thousands of likes on all these photos. So she just got this huge worldwide following, mostly in Australia, but including the states. Um, and so when she posted the song as a background song to an anniversary video. So her and her husband just had a recent anniversary. She posted a slideshow of them, but behind that slideshow was the song. And she said, this is, oh, by the way, followers, these, this is my brother's song behind this. And so all of her followers just went, oh, we love the song. And they all, and she put a link there to download it. And all of a sudden it started like, people started downloading the song in their thousands thanks to that post. And then it ended up on the iTunes homepage. So once it reached the you know top 200 on iTunes and it got high up on the singer-songwriter charts on iTunes, people searching for new music found, saw that and started downloading it as well. So over a, over a span of a week, it just you know reached the, went into the charts and then over the next few days, it was, uh, it was in the top you know, 80. Then it was in the top 40 the next day. Then it was in the top 20. I'm like, is this going to make it to number one? And I was uh, on a date uh, having some pizza, and when I, I used to get this text going, it's at number one, and I was, <laughs> I was like, oh, this is crazy. Um, so yeah, just to, just to have a, a number one single on iTunes uh, in any country, let alone two countries, is, is pretty cool, and, and having it be my home country of Australia was really sweet, and, and it was lovely to get a lot of press back there at home, and all my like high school friends and stuff like that were reaching out, going, dude, we're hearing about you, seeing, reading about you in the paper, and yeah, it was, it was really fun. Yeah, that's amazing. And I can't imagine um, the feeling and having talked to so many artists and looking at various artists. And, you know, these days I kind of, I look at what's going, happening with Spotify a lot, which I'm, I'm sure you do. And so, you know, so many of yeah, yeah. you challenge to get um, following and listens and streams and all that. And then suddenly <laughs> this happened. It must have been super exciting. What is your sister's name and what's the name of her podcast? So, so it's not a podcast. It's the, it's just the Instagram channel, like Instagram, and her Instagram is Revy Jane R E V I E Jane J A N E. And so, just on there, she does you know mostly photos and videos and just you know this classic Instagram fitness and lifestyle kind of channel. And um, and that's where she gets, gets this kind of mega following. You know, she, she makes it really relatable. She talks about motherhood and talks about the products that she uses that makes her life better and you know, talks about fitness and nutrition and so that's why people follow her. And um, But they're really dedicated fans who, who love her. She's, she, you know, she's got a great sense of humor and she's funny. So, um, you know, she makes it real personal and, and that's why they love her. And then so anything she shares, especially a, a family thing, there's my brother, there's my brother's music, they all went, oh, cool, that's support. So I was really grateful that she kind of shared that love that she that she gets from her followers. Um, and she shared that with me, so it was 
really cool. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, and I got podcast in my head because uh, Lisa thought it was a podcast, which is kind of funny because Lisa told me about being called an Insta grandma because we were, I was kind of joking that uh, she had messaged me on Instagram, um, Lisa, and days passed before I saw it. And I'm like, you know, I, I've been on Instagram for a while, but these messages kind of get buried. And she said, yeah, some of my, you know, team call me Insta- an Insta grandma. Anyway, but uh, so yeah. she she said podcast instead of Instagram. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, that's pretty yeah. cute. So yeah. how did you meet Funny. how did you meet yeah. Dixie Maxwell? And tell me a little bit about her. Just just like Lisa, just like you know, so many people in the San Diego music community, we all kind of like run into each other at shows. You know, we will do like a street fair or a, a you know backyard fundraiser or something where there's a bunch of musicians there. Um, and that's what the case was with Dixie. It was um, a few years ago, I was doing a backyard party. I think it was up in like Fallbrook or something. And it was a fundraiser for helping uh, uh, the women's shelter downtown or something. And, and that was, it, it was just, you know, it was Michael Tiernan was there. Veronica May was there. Dixie Maxwell was there. And I, I, I was the other, other, other artist. And I heard her and it's like, her voice is just so cool and so we stayed in touch and just with yeah all the all the videos that she posts she's you know i'll comment like awesome job and the videos that i post of, of my singing i'm like that's great but you just keep on keep in touch just like all the the whole music community we keep try to support each other and um and and, and say good things when we need when we need to hear it because it's what we do and as artists it's always good to get that validation um so you know we stay like that and then once i write this song i was just like you know i i just knew i wanted a voice like dixie's on there and um and so I reached out to her, and she was totally on board. So um, we ended up doing that, and ended up doing a, a show together to kind of release the video that we made together. And then, um, and then, and now because of the success of it, we think, we're thinking, you know, we should do some more stuff together. So we're going to do a, a, at least EP and probably a full album of just like Lee Coulter, Dixie Maxwell duet, just lovely duet stuff that kind of goes in line with everything that was kind of succeeded with the first song. Yeah, very nice. And what was the show like that you and Dixie did to promote the the video? Um, was it um, a regular show other than you were talking about the video? Was there anything, or was there anything special visually? Did you did you premiere the video there? Yeah, yeah, we yeah we premiered the video. So we you know we shot the video around town with the with an awesome local um, videographer, cinematographer, filmmaker. His name is Jason Lee Siegel. Uh, we, we we wanted to make it look like we were on tour, so we kind of jumped in the car and we shot the video over just you know a day. Um, I edited it. You know, I love filmmaking, and I edited the video myself. And so we got a premiere of this video. So Eve Encinitas is you know one of my new favorite places to play. It's the, on the one hundred and one in Encinitas, and it's just uh, it's you know it's a vegan vegetarian restaurant. Um, but in the back, they've got this awesome stage and awesome room, with, you know, great atmosphere and um, lighting. And and so I bring in my own sound system. And they've got this pull down screen that you can pull down. They've got a projector. And so we, we put the video on the projector and we kind of, Dixie did her set. She did an opening set of, you know, 30 minutes. And then we premiered the video with the, the full sound and the full video on the big screen. And, you know, we just kind of said a little bit about it before we showed it and then played the video and everyone kind of cheered for that. And um, then I did my set. And then in the middle of my set, I had Dixie come up and sing the song live with me. So yeah, it, it was definitely different. And, you know, usually I don't play any videos in my, in my show, but uh, it just, anytime I spend that much time and effort putting out a single with a video to it, it just feels like it's better, better than just putting it up on Facebook or whatever, just to do it live and make it special and have people be excited in person and you know, comment on it in person and get to be able to see people's reaction to it in real time instead of, yeah, you know, looking at comments on Facebook, it's just nice. It makes it feel like more of a community thing than it than just social media. Yeah, I bet that was super fun. It sounds really nice. What what was the name of the venue again? The what the venue? Uh-huh. You say the venue is Eve Encinitas. E V E. Okay. Eve Encinitas. Yeah. Cool. yeah, I'm actually playing there tomorrow night. Good but for you. Yeah, it sounds one. like a cool place. You were. It was making me think of a place that. Uh, I used to frequent in Santa Clara up there by uh, San Jose, San Francisco. Um, kind of restauranty with a little back yeah. room that had a lot of chairs and <laughs> a place where you could have maybe done yeah, something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, they have like comedy shows in there and yeah, the great music in there. Yeah, it's the, I think it's going to be quickly become the known spot for original music in, uh, in North County. 
That's fantastic. Because you know, I mean, obviously, belly up, belly up's a bigger, bigger venue, um, and with you know, and they got alcohol and everything at, at belly up. But uh, Eve is just a, a great, so like a cross between a restaurant and a. And a uh, it's definitely a listening room once we do get the concerts there, but uh, you know, there's no alcohol, but it's just it's just really in tune with what the the art the artist is saying. So that's what I like about it. Yeah, cool. Speaking of yeah. gigs, I see that you have something coming up in Florida, which all, every time I uh, notice an artist is traveling quite a bit, and it looks like it's a um, not a homecoming, but like a, a return uh, uh, kind of thing somewhere you've played before or an area you've played before and i'm specifically talking about dizzy rock that hasn't come and passed yet has it yeah no that that no that's going to be next weekend and I've, I've actually never played there before but i you know about five years ago I, I did a kind of travel around the country and played every little cafe and restaurant that would have me and every bar that would you know let me come in the doors <laughs> and play um so i hadn't been i hadn't been yeah, I haven't really done any much traveling beyond like I've got a little hub in St. Louis where I can go back and get some get some shows in St. Louis and you know in California, up in Northern California and all up the coast. But yeah, not really Florida or East Coast stuff. Um, so yeah, so this is the first time. You know, I know I've got little pockets of fans here and there. So and you know, some of them in Miami, some of them in Orlando. And it's a bit too far to get to the Delray Beach, but uh, you know, in case they're, they're they're feeling up to it, I just wanted to put out the word that I've got this little show going on at Dizzy Rock, and um, and you know, it's just always nice to play in a, a different area and see who if someone hasn't seen me and I've been following me for like three years, and they go, like, yes, we'll drive. You know, I have I've been fortunate enough to have people drive like five hours one time I was playing up in Utah and someone was driving from Colorado and we should drive five hours because we saw you playing here and you know stuff and then I, and and I've had it where people would have done that when they didn't know and I because I didn't get the word out because I'm the worst person marketing in, in the world um and then I feel bad so I always just say hey, you know if you're this is what's happening if you can make it cool uh, I'm sorry if it's too far but I understand no pressure <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing, people driving that far to see you. And uh, what's the deal with the, do you say St. Louis is where you have a bit of a hub that you can do some shows? Yeah, so St. Louis, you know, the, the hub there kind of just started with a, a friend of mine. Well, started, he started out as a fan who heard me on Sirius XM Coffee House. So in 2011, I had a couple songs in, in rotation on the Coffee House channel on Sirius XM. And, um, and I had a, a fan that heard me on there reach out to me and basically we said, you should come to St. Louis. And I get these, you get messages all the time every day, pretty much saying I should be in this city. I should come to this city, whatever. Um, and it's great. You know, people want me to come there, but I, I can't get there. I can't just come to a city to play a show. If I don't, you know, have a following or if I, you know, I can't book something that's going to pay, you know, I can't, I, I can't be out of pocket. So I just thought it was one of those, Oh, you're going to come to St. Louis. But in the end he said, no, no, come to St. Louis. I'll, I'll pay you good money to, play at my Christmas party or a house concert, whatever, I want you to, I want to see you live. And, and so it was one of those situations where it's like, oh, you should have said that at the start. And, <laughs> and so this guy, this guy, John, uh, he had me come out, play his work Christmas party, and we became good friends. And subsequently, we've been playing all these parties that he hosts all around the country and then down in Mexico. And there's, he's just a huge supporter of what I do. And there's a huge supporter of a lot of musicians, actually. He's one of those kind of like, it reminds me of back in the, uh, the old days, and they would have had, you know, the artists and the the wealthy who who, who hire the artists to make it, to enrich their lives. It's like he's like one of these kind of guys, um, and and so he just he's always surrounded by artists, and he, he makes sure that they're doing well, and, and he, he values how they enrich his life. So um, it, it's been a cool relationship. So and his base is St. Louis, and so I'll, I'll go out to St. Louis a few times a year, and he, he's he's big within his community as far as you know. He, his, his business people, his friends, his you know, the politicians. He's just like one of those people that's h- uh, higher up in his community. So he puts on big events and, uh, and the, he, because of him, everyone there in, in pockets of St. Louis have gotten to know me and my music. And so I've got a, I've developed over the last about five years uh, a following in St. Louis, and that's been really cool. That's really nice. People like him are, <laughs> are great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I never would have thought, but yeah, it's cool. <laughs> And then uh, Java Joe's. So you, I assume you've yep. done Java Joe's many times. This venue has come up on uh, three different episodes, if I include this one. But um, I had a gal on yeah. the podcast named Amy Killingsworth, who hosts a concert, a house concert series in San Antonio, Texas, that happened to catch um, a duo called the Lovebirds and also Lisa 
Sanders there, yep. at Java Joe's, and then Lisa, of course, talked about it. Can you kind of tell me about your history with the place? And I, I ask partly because I'm just, it's, I'm very, very curious about it. I've never been there, and, and hopefully, I will be someday. But uh, yeah, so Java Joe's is kind of it's, it's kind of the uh, iconic representation of the San Diego coffee house scene. Um, you know, it's. I don't know the exact history, and, and there's plenty of San Diego San Diego musicians that will know this better than me. But you know, from my understanding of it, is that it's it's been around in different areas, but as Java Joe's in different. I think it was in Poway at one point. It's been in um, down in Normal Heights. It's it's moved around, um, but it's always been Java Joe's. And Java Joe's is it's about Joe the owner, um, and so Joe the owner has always you know done coffee and and had good live music um and so wherever it is over the last you know 15 years or even maybe longer i'm not even sure how long it's been around and you know, wherever the location has been but it it's it kind of basically set the was the setting where jason Mraz and jewel and then every other artist that you know that anyone is gregory page and um in san diego it, it kind of set the stage for them to be able to hone their craft and build their followings and people would show up to Java Joe's and, you know, to be out the door watching Jason back in the day before he kind of blew it all up. And so, and that, that's kind of how it started. That's how Java Joe's became what it is today. Just knowing that it was this place where, you know, people like Jason and, and Jewel could, you know, really shine um, you know, because we, we play as musicians, we play so many different types of gigs. We play restaurants to pay the bills and corporate gigs, but these these listening rooms, these cafes where people are all paying attention, um, is where we get to really learn what, what the power of what we do is about. Um, when the people are listening, we can tell stories behind the songs. We're not just playing covers. We're not just playing our originals without introducing them, uh, without interacting with the crowd. And so Java Joe's was kind of like the original uh, coffee house that kind of established that vibe for San Diego. And San Diego's got such a vibrant kind of singer songwriter coffee house scene um, that, and Java Joe's is, is kind of the, the flagship of that. So that, that's what it is. And, and today it's an old town and, and it's, it's latest incarnation is kind of looks like a tiki kind of room. It's that kind of open air and, and wooden fence walls and it's, it's kind of got a straw roof kind of thing on the on the sides. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, and so yeah, just they're serious about the music. It's not just it's not just a place to eat and get coffee. This is a it's a music venue. And, um, but yeah, this is a, a lot of history, and people just know that they're going to get when they get to Java Joe's. It's going to be a good acoustic show. And how did you initially get connected there? What or when did your first gig happen? How did it come about? Java Joe's. Hmm, that means to probably. I don't know, I can't even remember. I, I know I played at the last one, uh, the last venue. I can't remember if I played before that one. I think I may have. Um, but even probably five, six years ago, Just uh, it's usually someone, it, uh, most venues I play at, it's someone else has me open for them or they invite me. Some other artist is, I'm playing this show, you want to come and play it with me? Um, and so I can't remember exactly my first job at Joe's shows, but I think it's probably like that where someone was playing. I know I played with Don Mitchell back in the day at Java Joe's in its previous location to now. And uh, it was just like, oh, we got to do a show. Where should we do it? And like, well, there's a lot of that. And, you know, it, it, for us being a songwriter, there's only a few places that, that um, are, are a good venue for us to play where the audience is going to listen, as well as a, a venue that's reasonable for us to, to fill. I mean, you know, it's, it's tougher to get a, a show at the belly up for us because, you know, they, for a singer songwriter, a local singer songwriter, they don't really want to do that on a weekend. They want they want to get the big cover bands there on the weekend and the, and the, and the big touring bands there on the, on the weekend. Um, so on a Tuesday night, they'll give you a Tuesday night. So on a Tuesday night to fill an eight hundred people room, it's just so tough for an up and coming you know, unknown singer songwriter. Um, so belly up's not our, our go to one that goes to our mind. So when we, when we want to do a show, we think well stats. We think Java Joe's. These are you know eighty people, a hundred people in the room. Um, more likely to get a Friday or Saturday night, um, and, and so Java Joe's is just one of those ones that, especially once you once once Joe knows who you are and knows that you've got a bit of a following and he really likes your music, um, then he's like, oh, you can if you if you want if you're two months out and you want a Friday, you can probably give it to you at this point. So uh, it's just it's more of a connected kind of. It's 
it's almost like we're equals. And if other venues, and especially if you're not from that town, if you're touring, you would go to another venue, they treat you like, you know, no, like you're nothing. But with, with Joe, <laughs> uh, it's more personable, and he, and he cares, you know. So that's cool. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like a great place. Yeah. Back in 2011, it looked like a lot of interesting things were going on for you, and maybe, I don't know if this was kind of a, a first big year for you, but I, I had read that you, I read earlier today that you had some opening slots for Tom Jones and Chuck Berry and you're doing stuff with the, at the yep. uh, Sirius XM coffee house. What, what was happening at that time that uh, caught all the attention for you? Um, so I, you know, it was basically just the, the, the coffee house airplay, which had just happened because a friend of mine had sent in the, um, the steep debut CD. Mm-hmm. It came out in 2009, but you know, I, I was just, unsigned, self-managed, just trying to figure out what I was doing. And I'd, and I'd send my stuff out to every radio station and everything. So in 2009, when it came out, I, I did that and nothing was happening. So I was just, I was just doing my thing, playing restaurants and playing around San Diego, making a living just, you know, $200 at a time at, at restaurants and whatnot. Um, but then, you know, I had a friend reach out and said, Oh, I'll send it into, I'll send it a few places. I was like, I already did that. And then he sent it in and all of a sudden I started playing on a coffee house and they picked up two songs, and they started playing that on the Coffee House channel three times a day, each song three times a day, and you know, which is great for the royalties, but also just great for exposure. And that's how I got fans and the ability to you know, open for people that um, you know, like Tom Jones and um, just, just through connections. And, and through honestly, some of the, sometimes these things happen. Even like this number one in Australia and number one in New Zealand on iTunes. Like, I, I don't know what it means. But I don't know, you know, what what tangibly that that means, but. If nothing else, it's just it's just a good representation of, of where you're at in the in your music. So when you can say that to people, when I can say to you know the people that are hiring someone to open for Tom Jones, they can say like oh, I'm I'm on Sirius XM right now, and they go they just go oh okay he's at that level. It's not he's not just in his bedroom anymore, you know. <laughs> um, and and sometimes and, and sometimes that 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 uh, just just that alone helps more than anything else. Um, and so that that was that's what happened with with 2011. And so once I got in the coffee house, which was crazy because I I wasn't making enough money to pay rent in San Diego. I actually had to move out of my place and, and uh, because I couldn't afford rent. Um, and so, but at the same time, right there, as I had to move out, it, I start getting the airplay on like national Sirius XM. But you know, I didn't get any royalties that until later so i was like well, it still doesn't help me but everyone's like calling me going this is great you're making it and i'm like uh i i gotta move out of my house <laughs> oh, i don't no. know i don't know what, i don't know what to say about that um and so yeah so it, it, subsequently just the momentum of that yeah and eventually the royalties did come around and, and the momentum of of having my songs being heard more and then you know to use that to to open the people and and further my career just kind of added up and it, and it worked out in the end but you know it's a slow it's a slow course sometimes um and you just gotta I, i've been saying lately you just gotta hang in there like hone hone it and hang in that's the two things that an artist needs to do you gotta hone your, hone your craft and hang in it's just about time if you keep on honing your craft and it gets gets to a point where it's decent over time you're going to get opportunities and, and you know you might quit before maybe it's a good idea to quit before you get that opportunity because, you know, there's something else you want to do, but I didn't have an option. This is all I wanted to ever wanted to do. And I didn't have an option to quit. So, and, and then, and then, so, and then inevitably other stuff happened. Stuff just happens. If you stay, stay there, just hang in there. I love that. And did you end up having yeah. to move? I did. I moved out. Uh, I had to move in with family for a year. And so, yeah, until the royalties came in. <laughs> <laughs> the life of a musician. Yeah. yeah. Totally. And everyone's, you know, it's, it's glamorous and I'm like posting stuff on Facebook about how everything's going great. And, um, you know, I, I try to keep it real as well, but, you know, it, there's also an element of like, you, know, you post about how oh, this happened today on Sirius XM or, you know, I had to, I, they flew me out to New York. Um, and I played in the Sirius XM studios, and so I'm posting photos of how I'm like playing at Sirius XM studios in New York. Um, at the same time that I know that like my bank account's empty and you know, I got to move out. Um, but you know, so but you don't want people don't want to hear that part of it. They don't want to hear like you know, music sucks and they're like music industry is so tough. They want to hear. They want to just want. They just want to know about you going to the New York studio kind of thing. Um, so, <laughs> so it's kind of it's true. And yeah. you know, I hadn't thought about it from the 
dual aspects of the fans and, you know, what they want to hear and talk about. Although I'm sure, you know, there are many of them who appreciate understanding these things, but your peers, oh my goodness, I'm sure that, that, um, I mean, I've, I've listened to a few stories and, and sometimes if you just listen between the lines or read between the lines when I'm talking to guests here, you know, you can tell that they, they can have gone through some challenging times, of course, because it's, you know, not easy to make it in, in the field of music, but, um, yeah, I love that hone and hone and hang in, uh, uh, great advice. Yeah, totally. And yeah, and, and these days I, I try to be way more real. Like back then, uh, yeah, this was 2011, seven years ago, I wasn't sure how to approach the whole thing because, you know, I was trying to be good at marketing and I, I thought the negativity of like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of suffering here at the same time um, would, would, would detract from my, my listeners and my potential new fans that were trying to look me up and stuff. But now I, I feel like the authenticity um and, and just being more comfortable in myself as an as an adult and as a, an artist, like I, I would I would share much more of that that kind of authenticity and, and and talk about the duality of it all. And I even got songs about the the duality of success. You know, to, to every every bit of greatness in your life is is got a there's, a there's a price that pays that kind of thing. So, um, and yeah, everything has a flip side. Yeah, yeah, I think that it's great that you you do share that more and more because they're, uh, I guess just because of all of the, <laughs> the noise that there is, um, online and with social media, it's nice when people can hear about what's really happening, what's real with you. And they are, as I was telling, um, a, a former bandmate recently that, um, to try to inject some elements of the weird, uh, little world that he, that is his own, uh, as he communicates with his email list and his, his fan, his local fans, because uh, as much as they are interested in his music, they are interested in, in him, and arguably even more so as much as they love your music, they really are interested in you. So I think that's great. That's good stuff. Right. It reminded totally. me, yeah. as a matter of fact, I, I wanted to share a quick story. In, in 2017, I went to London to a conference. Um, it's a marketing group that I, I belong to, and uh, there was a young woman there who's on the exterior at the heights of success, and she has done very well. Uh, she's an entrepreneur, and as she told this story, not too dissimilar to yours, um, uh, that culminated in riding in a helicopter with one of her, you know, business idols, and inside yeah. she was literally crying because kind of the proverbial, you know, my, my bank account's empty. But but for her, there were uh, there were other things that were going on, and it may have been fi- actually it may have been partly financial, but she just had so many things that you couldn't see from the outside that were going on and she talked she shared them and it was um yeah it was pretty impactful but uh yeah i don't know yeah it's awesome yeah reminds me reminds me a little bit um did you write your anti-bio anti-anti-bio and bio or (laughs) on your website yes (laughs) yes i did there's a lot of anti's on there yes um yes i did write the anti-bio that's kind of what i'm talking about um with the um kind of um, putting forth this perceived, or how how people should be perceived, or how musicians. You know, in my anti bio, I, I write about how, you know, for some reason, that uh, people have come to expect that there's some amazing story um, that makes the music better. Um, that, that some backstory, like, and I and I kind of you know, people ask me all the time when I'm when I play like the, the background gigs, the, the money gigs, the bread and butter gigs. They they come up to me. And, you know, a lot of the time they feel bad for me and I like, like, Oh, I'm sorry. No one's really listening. We're only having our dinner and having conversations. And these, I still play these gigs. You know, I've got a number, this is, a, this is reality. I've got a number one single in Australia and iTunes uh, and New Zealand on iTunes. And I'm still playing background restaurant gigs in San Diego where no one's listening and no one's giving a round of applause. And I'm fine with that. I know what that gig is. That's my best color. I consider that my day job. I'm getting paid to play a guitar in the corner super low pressure. Uh, I'm, I get to hone my craft and get better. And, but you know, at the end of the day, when people finish, I finish a gig and people come like, Oh, sorry, no one's listening. We kind of, we're all enjoying it. That's the one I feel listening. And I'm like, Oh good. Like uh, this is my job. I get paid to do this. This is fine. Um, but they said, Oh, you got, you so you got that voice. You should go on the voice. You should go, you know, do American Idol. America's got talent. And, and, you know, not that, not that these avenues aren't great for, for, you know, certain people. And if that's, if that's what your route is, you envision, go for it. Um, and that absolutely can be used as a tool. But for me, the emphasis that I see so much on these shows about the backstory and the build up, the build up of hype 
to me, that has nothing to do with the music. Um, I love music. You know, I do love a good story too. I love films. I love good stories. Um, but I see so often when people, uh, you know, they build up the hype enough, they build up the story enough. And then, uh, a song that I think is mediocre will be more popular because the backstory is good where I'm like, I just want to like, someone could have the most bland story. So someone could have a story where they were privileged and they got everything kind of head into the them. And you know what? They still ended up being a great songwriter somehow. You know, I do think a lot of great songwriting comes from struggle. And it would surprise me if someone with absolute privilege that never had to struggle through anything was a great songwriter. But I think it's also possible because even in privilege is struggle. Um, everyone's got their own struggle. But uh, this idea that some backstory or some like path makes the music better is ridiculous to me because a good song is just a good song um and so i I don't like the idea of like this is lee colter's bio and he went through this now he's here i'm like just listen to the music you like it or you want and if it moves you cool it's got nothing to do with my story um if 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 it does you'll hear it in the music Uh, and so that's that's the kind of hype machine that i that i don't like about you know, a lot of the music industry and and and, and general media uh, and the way we we kind of hype up artists and whatever the, the platform, whatever the art is, um, without really paying attention to what to the content of what the artist is saying or doing. Um, so that's why I have an anti bio instead of a bio <laughs> on the <laughs> on page. Well, I love them. I'm going to go back and, and read them. I was scanning them and, you know, it just kind of tickled me to get to the part where like, here's the bio that you came here for. If you're somebody who's trying to figure out whatever, if you, you know, something about me for some marketing purpose or booking me purpose or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. Great. Or a story like in like news articles, mm. they're doing like writing an article and I need to know where I'm from. Sure. I got you. Yep. But, <laughs> but yeah, the whole idea that, that this is, this is going to make my music better. And like, he's like this mysterious, like there's always a mysteriousness and a coolness to bio. And I'm like, it doesn't need to be cool. Is the music cool? If the music's cool, that's all you need to know. <laughs> yeah. You know, and to back up your, what you were saying about the, um, American Idol and voice and those types of things. I, uh, one of my former guests, uh, Lisa Lushner Anderson, who's a singer was, is an alumni of seasons two and three of American Idol. And we were talking and, and, uh, I, I brought it up of course. And, um, as we're talking about it, she at one point goes, she, she said, um, you know, I, I didn't realize when I first got involved that it's really not about music. It's about ratings. And so they build up these <laughs> incredible stories, which I, I understand there's some basis in, but yeah, it's not so much about the music from what I understand. Totally. <laughs> yeah. I and mean, it's totally, it's totally entertaining. I like, I, I think, I mean, it's clearly successful entertainment to mm-hmm. do that. Mm-hmm. I just, it's, to me, that's not what music is about. That's what, that's what television is about. That's what, you know, stories are about but uh music is a different thing and and i I don't like conflating the two and i think that's what's happening in that in that world do you play in um uh full bands from time to time and by that i mean you know electric and and drums and all that stuff yeah i've got yeah i've got uh, i've got a drummer um i've got a good it's kind of i I talk about it being kind of modular you know a lot of the time i play duo it's me and my percussionist angela catron um so she'll play cajon and i'm playing guitar um a lot of times the two of us sometimes we have a trio with i have melissa barrison who's a killer fiddler like a violin player that just can play any song that you just throw at her in in, on the spot and she's just nailing solos and and she's just amazing so We'll have that trio. Sometimes I got Kevin Freeby, who's a killer bass player. He, he'll be playing um, bass guitar like a like a monster, and so we have that. And then I mean, he's playing the bass. Then my percussionist can bring the drum kit, and so yeah, we fill it out. And then my longtime guitarist Josh Bonus would come and join every now and again. And uh, and so yeah, we, it just depends on what the gig is, what the setup is, who's available, and we can go anywhere from me solo to duo all the way up to like five of us on stage. So yes, absolutely. And, and the more the merrier, it's always fun to have more people on stage. Yeah, I love it. I, I um, All of my playing has always been in band configurations and then um, not just on drum kit, but I, I have done a number of uh, like acoustic shows doing hand percussion, which is a lot of fun too, but um, I always love to hear. I, I hope that I can find some uh, content of you doing that too. I've, uh would be fun to see for sure. You are... Yeah, yeah I've got some cool little live videos there. Oh, cool. Hey, I, I meant to ask you, so, um, and it's because I'm so new to you and as I, I don't remember if we were recording yet, but my morning was a little wheels off, so I didn't get all my research time in, but what is the album that you recorded in 2011 and can people still find it? Um, I haven't even looked on iTunes yet, but I was looking at some other places and, and didn't find anything that went that far back. So no, so 
So 2011, uh, so my, my original, the, the one that was playing in 2011 on Sirius XM was actually an album I released in 2009. But, um, and that was just self-titled Lee Coulter. And then I, 2011, I started recording and then released in 2012. My second album, Mr. Positivity, which is kind of an ironic title because I had a lot of songs and I still have a lot of songs that are about, you know, mindset and, and positivity and but the, the song itself was about how you know that that struggle of trying to stay positive and try to trying to spread positivity through music while not knowing how i was going to pay rent so that so that kind of is about that uh, irony but saying all that and i released a third album after that, saying all that i recently just you know since the success of the the latest single had taken down those albums so those albums are not available i was like i was, i record everything i've re- released i've recorded myself um and so where in my production levels at that point even though i was selling those and even though they played it on serious xm the artist i am now is not happy with what people could hear if they went there and if they went to download those songs now even the ones they played on serious xm I, I you know i still play those songs every show i play i know i can do them better and not only perform them better but i can produce them but i used to be i used to edit these songs and mix these songs on this this old ancient program from like 2000 on the computer um and it was called <laughs> cool edit pro and it just yeah it just didn't have any effects and it was just the, it, the whole thing was just a mess and i was just I, I was always self-conscious about it and i was just lucky that they played it on serious xm i mean it was decent enough but i hear it now and i'm like oh i can i know i can do way better than that and 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 the proof is in the pudding with the with the this, this single going to number one on iTunes. I'm like, I know that what I'm doing now is it just has an audio quality, has a performance quality that, that can really do the songs justice. So I've taken down my first three albums um, and I'm going to redo um, not necessarily the albums in full, but um, the, the songs that, that are meaningful and that, that have kind of stood the test of time for myself as far as playing the sets. When I play the sets, I know what songs of mine work for my audience. And I'm going to re-record all those with with the quality that I have now, and so I'll release that hopefully within the next year, so people that know my stuff are you know freaking out. But uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll see how high that my ego is a little hurt that the people aren't breaking down the doors. But um, but it's it's hopefully it's going to be fine. I've had a few people say, "Oh, where's it? Where's this album?" But um, it hasn't been too much of a problem thus far. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks for sharing that. And lastly. Um, you are a dad, I gather, and I also noticed that you've written some children's books in the past. Um, yes. Have you still, are you going to do any more of that and maybe slip in some dad stuff there for us, for people that don't know you that well? Well, yeah, well, as far as music and dad uh, stuff goes on, one of those albums that I'm going to re-record one song that I wrote has a lullaby for my son. It's called Safe and Sound. Um, and so it's not available now, but um, but I will re-record that one. So I have written a, a few songs kind of, well, that one's specifically just about him, the whole song, but a few songs allude to him. Um, and the children's books, you know, when I was reading Dr. Seuss to him, when I, when he, you know, he's nine years old now, um, but when he was, you know, two, three, and four, and reading Dr. Seuss with him, it was just like so fun. And it just reminded me of being a kid and, and reading these books. And just as an adult and as a songwriter, as a lyricist, reading these books uh, at this age, just going, wow, what genius. And I, I was just so inspired. I thought, I want to do, I want to strive to do something just memorable and just cute and just helpful to children, this, this, to entertain kids who are you know, easily entertained, but at the same time to, to, to be, the, to entertain them night after night with the same story just seemed like a fun challenge. And I used to tell him, I used to make up stories every night. He would want a story made up. Um, and so I'd sit there and I'd kind of make up a story. And this, it was just, I just had so much fun doing it. And it was just, I cherish that part of my, that time in my life. Um, you know, he doesn't have me make up stories anymore at night. He's, he's reading novels to himself, so he doesn't need any more. But, you know, so, so those three books, those three books came out of, Loving the children's stories and having, you know, the first one, when it, you know, I didn't know I was going to write multiple, but the first one just came to me because the theme of it is about accent and perspective. Um, and I thought this is an opportunity to teach children because, you know, I, being in America as a foreigner with an accent, um, I always thought it was crazy that I'd speak to, you know, most Americans I speak to, they're like, oh, you got a cool accent. And I'm like, oh, I said to you, I love your accent. And they, they, they would laugh. But some would say, oh, I don't have an accent. They say, I love your accent. And I'm like, I love your accent. And they go, well, I don't have accent. You're the one with the accent. And I'm like, these are, these are adults 
who don't understand that they have an accent. Um, <laughs> and, and I thought that that that's a that's a ridiculous notion, and, and to that lack of perspective um, needs to be taught to children. And so that's where I got the idea for for a little message in a book. So my first book is called "You Talk Funny Too," and it's about it's about stepping outside of your um, yourself and, and seeing that no matter if someone seems exotic to you, if someone seems, seems different to you, you seem exactly the same in, uh, level of exoticness to, to them. So uh, just trying to teach that perspective. So that, 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 that's where it made a good children's book and it's rhyming because you know, obviously having a skill set of being a lyricist, but that helped with the, the rhyming and it's just a cute little thing. And, and I, uh, the timing was great because I'm not an illustrator, but I, at the same time I was thinking of this story, I met an Australian, uh, a fellow Australian that also lived in uh, San Diego who happened to be an illustrator. Um, and so, and so we, I, I, I heard her, I heard her uh, ordering a coffee at a, a coffee shop in Cardiff. And I said, oh, you're Aussie. And she's like, yeah. So we got to chatting and we, and what do you do? And she's like, I'm an illustrator. I'm like, well, I'm writing a children's book about accents. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, so, and so she's the one that, that um, illustrated all three of my books. And it was a really fun collaboration. That's cool. Sure. And yeah, just, just to be able to, to, to teach a little something in, in a different platform was really fun. That's very cool. And I think before we were recording, I, I had commented that I was watching a video interview of you and I'm like, oh, of course he has an accent. And yeah, so and that's funny. You wrote yes. that about, <laughs> you talk funny too. I know I, yeah. I know I have one. Lee, <laughs> thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I know that uh, people can find out where you are and what you're doing at LeeCoulter.com and it's Coulter, C-O-U-L-T-E-R.com. Is there anything um, else that's not, uh, I guess, time sensitive since this will be out later next month as we're recording and we'll live on for a long, long time that you would want people to know about? No, I just said, just LeeCoulter.com is where they can see what I'm doing, uh, the upcoming shows or the latest videos. Like the videos is where I kind of really push people because like every, every single I do now is going to have a video to it. So that, and that way you can relate to the song a bit, a bit more of a full experience with the video attached to it. So, and, and they're all going to be on LeeCoulter.com. So that's, that's the place to go. Cool. Well, I love the, the new single, We, You, Me, and I look forward to digging into your currently published work. <laughs> and uh, it was a yes. pleasure to talk with you, man. Same, Roberto. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. Cheers. Language, not just some words, it's everything. Got the tickets to where the sky meets the freeway. I feel every word every time I sing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How time slows down with you. I pick it up, pick it up now. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Just some words, our hearts and souls. We 
Take what we got and twist it in the music If it's coming to an end and I don't want to let go Yeah, yeah, yeah How time slows down with you And I don't want to pick it up now Here we go, here we go, here we go And we're headed to forever It couldn't get any better We, yeah, you and me Here we go, here we go, here we go Cause we're doing it together It couldn't get any better We, yeah, you and me Here we go, here we go, here we go Cause we're doing it together It couldn't get any better We, yeah, you and me Hey, thanks again for listening. This episode was powered by the Unstopping Musician's Guide to Getting Paid Gigs, How to Get Booked and Paid What You're Worth Over and Over Again, available in paperback and for Kindle on Amazon. The ebook is now available on Apple Books, Kobo.com, and just about anywhere else that you might find ebooks. It's also available as a standalone podcast called the Unstopping Musician's Guide podcast. You can learn more about the book and companion podcast at unstoppingmusician.com forward slash book. I'd love it if you picked up a copy, and I'd love it even more if you left a review on Amazon. With much gratitude, peace, love, and more cowbell. <laughs>